Take, for illustration, Tai Lam Chung Reservoir in the northwest of Hong Kong, just beyond Chun Wan. Here is the body of water itself, as seen in an aerial photograph from 1993. But the reservoir system extends well beyond this body of water alone. Concrete catchwaters deliver water to the reservoir from the surrounding area. They extend as far north as Shek Kong, as far east as the foothills of Taimoshan, and as far west as Castle Peak. Once water is collected in the reservoir, then it has historically been delivered via a system of filters, tunnels, and pumps to Chunwan and onwards into the heart of the Kowloon Peninsula, as may be seen in this diagram. Or take Shek Pik Reservoir, which may be found in southern Lantau. Here, water is gathered from two long snaking catchwaters, extending far to the west and far to the east. A tunnel, meanwhile, extends almost all the way to Taiyo on the far coast of Lantau to the north. Once collected in the reservoir, water is then delivered to Pueyo, uh, pumped to Mueyo, sent through a 10 kilometer long pipeline through a connecting chamber just off Hailing Chow, received at Sandy Bay near Kennedy Town on Hong Kong Island, and distributed either in the urban center of the island itself or sent through yet another tunnel across the harbor to Kowloon. Or to provide a third example for you, take High Island Reservoir, which is found in Southern Saikang. Through tunnels and catchwaters, the reservoir gathers water from across the Saikung Peninsula, extending all the way north to the foothills of Mount Hallows. From a pumping station located at the reservoir, the water is then delivered underground beneath Lion Rock and below the former Kowloon Canton Railway, all the way to the lower Xingmen Reservoir, whence it is then distributed in Kowloon and possibly to the island having in the process spanned across many interconnected different landscapes in Hong Kong. Tai Lam Chang, Shek Pik, High Island, and Hong Kong's other reservoirs then are huge network systems extending far and deep into its hinterland, connecting that hinterland with urban and industrial cores. The overall system of these and the other reservoirs across Hong Kong can be seen in these maps, which date from the early 1960s through to the 1980s, by which time this infrastructure has effectively become integrated colony-wide, excluding only the more obscure islands. Now, there are several reasons why Hong Kong's reservoirs should have been constructed in such a manner. One is geological. Hong Kong is composed mostly of granite and other forms of volcanic rock, as could be seen here on this geological map from 1936. Um, and supposed to be a video, but I don't think it's going to play. Um, as well in this video, it shows my feet getting very wet as water streams off a hillside in Hong Kong. Rain which falls during the annual rainy season merely runs off hillsides and into the sea unless deliberately captured and conserved. The other reason why the reservoirs developed in this manner was socioeconomic. These reservoirs must be seen in the context of Hong Kong's long and desperate search for sufficient water, especially from 1949 onwards. Hong Kong has a history of severe droughts including those of 1902, 1929, 1938, 1957, 1963, and 1967. During the same moment, from the 1930s to the 1980s, many other schemes to collect each and every drop of water in the colony were begun, including attempts at deep well drilling, the artificial inducement of rain by the Royal Air Force, which Fiona Williamson has written about, the regulation of consumer behavior, as Sam shall discuss next week, and most famously, by the importation of water through an agreement with the communist authorities in water-rich water Guangdong, 
from 1960 onward, which Florence, David Clayton, Nelson Lee, Dorothy Tang, and others have discussed. And many reservoirs around the world operate in a comparable manner to the Hong Kong system. In the late 19th century, uh, in Birmingham, for, in, uh, for instance, in England, water was delivered to the city from a valley in Northern Wales. Daniel Jaffe, who had been an engineer on that Birmingham scheme, then led construction on the Titan Reservoir on, on Hong Kong Island, operating on a similar principle, before he died of malaria in 1921, contracted in the course of his work. But Hong Kong's unique combined geological and socio-economic situation made this system of reservoirs and catch waters almost unprecedented in extent, the government of Hong Kong believed, relative to elsewhere around the world. But I want to think less today about why the reservoirs were built in this manner or their international uniqueness. Rather, I wish to consider the consequences of this extensive system, which I have just elucidated. First, I'm going to narrate the construction of these reservoir and catchwater systems in Hong Kong. Then I'm going to proceed to explore the consequences. The first being the major point that this was a fundamental reconstruction of the geography of Hong Kong. For the first time, creating intimate connections between areas like Sai Kang or Southern Lantau in central Hong Kong Island and Kowloon. In the process, turning rural Hong Kong into an operational landscape in Neil Brenner's town, that is a landscape of utility for the urban and industrial center. At the same time, this geographical realignment led the colonial state to becoming embroiled in such issues as the management of the sacral landscape in Hong Kong leading to an almost unprecedented level of state depth in its relations with rural communities. Then I want to unspool a further two key themes in more detail. The first being conservation and how water infrastructure drove the replanting of forests and their protection, including the management of fire, and also incarceration, how, the wa how this water infrastructure created enabled the creation of new penal institutions and used the people incarcerated there in their programs of construction and management. I'm keeping the theoretical structure of this piece to a, to a minimum really in this talk, so as to foreground the material narrative. There are important influences here from notions of the assemblage, uh, notions of landscape and infrastructure, and from urban political ecology which I would be happy to talk about at greater length in the Q&A if people are interested. First then, a brief narrative of the development of this system, both in the pre-colonial period and in the early years of British rule, water in Hong Kong was collected from streams and wells. But then from the construction of the first reservoir in Hong Kong at Pok Fu Lam, in 1860, the catchwater system expanded across the island. This can be seen in this map from the 1930s, which shows the catchwaters expanding outwards into the island's hills to supply Titan Reservoir in particular. In the early years of the 20th century, this system then expanded on the Kowloon Peninsula, tapping the water of the Kowloon Hills in order to provision the settlements, industry and docklands which were developing to the south. The mid 1930s were a major threshold, I would argue, in the expansion of this system. Not least in this moment, the system expanded beyond the range of the Kowloon Hills um, for the first time from 1937 when catch waters from the Xingmen Reservoir reached all the way to Taimoshan, a mountain roughly in the center of Kowloon from which may, many rivers radiate. So too, work on the Tai Lam Chung Reservoir began in 1938, this being the most distant reservoir yet, and the first to tap a range of hills really, rather than those on the island or in the Kowloon range. They were interrupted by the Japanese occupation between December 1941 and uh, August 1945, work on this reservoir would then be resurrected, uh, uh, resurrected after the war. So too, in the mid-1930s, 
The government of Hong Kong began a long, long-standing partnership with Binnie, Deacon and Gawley, the consulting engineers who would oversee reservoir construction until the 1980s. And importantly, in 1936, it was felt that all of the possible catchment areas on the island had already been tapped, therefore necessitating deeper exploitation of resources elsewhere, which it had become possible to transport the island thanks to the construction of Cross Harbour Tunnels in 1930, and then a second in the, in the mid-1930s. With the end of the war in August 1945, the expansion of this system continued in earnest, first with the construction of Tai Lam Chung and its catchwaters between 1952 and 1957, driven by the need here for water both in British military camps in the northwest and the expansion of urban Kowloon and Xinhuan. Tai Lam Chung was never going to be sufficient to solve all of the colony's issues with water, however, and therefore even in the year of its completion, work had begun on another reservoir at Shek Pik in southern Lantau. Plover Cove was then built in the mid-1960s, whilst the disruption of the water supply from Guangdong during the Cultural Revolution was decisive in the construction of High Island Reservoir in southern Saikung uh, between 1969 and 1978. There were other reservoirs and such water collection programs as the Indus River pumping scheme during this time too, but these are the decisive developments. This narrative comes to a natural end in 1983, at which time plans for another scheme which would have turned Tolo Harbour into a reservoir were abandoned amidst a sense here that all of the economically viable catchments across the whole of Hong Kong had been tapped and that reform and opening up in China had reduced the threat of an unstable supply of water from Guangdong. So having presented this short narrative, I now wish to explore the consequences of this construction. The first point I want to make here is central. The development of this hydrological infrastructure represented a fundamental restructuring of Hong Kong's geography. It connected the most isolated reaches of the colony to urban and industrial cores, transforming these into, productive uh, into a productive resource, thereby transforming the relationship between rural and urban Hong Kong, and also connect, uh, turning Hong Kong into a connected hydro hydro hydrological unit for the first time, even if this has perhaps been overshadowed by the issue of the importation of water into Hong Kong. Here are two examples of this restructuring at work. Before the construction of the reservoir at Tai Lam Chang, there had been relatively little penetration of the area by the colonial state. There were two military camps in the vicinity from the 1930s onwards at Tai Lam and Shek Kong respectively. There was also the Castle Peak Road which had been constructed between 1909 and 1920, and can be seen here on this map from 1922. This road was, called, was known as the Trunk Road, in imitation of the Great Trunk Road in British India, running between Calcutta and Amritsar. As with that Indian road, it had been built to facilitate trade and make colonial policing easier. But the manner of its construction in many ways testifies to the limited reach of the state into the area. The road represented here in yellow merely hugs the coastline, representing only a thin veneer of control over the, the deeper interior. After the construction of the reservoir, however, Tai Lam Chang became deeply integrated with the rest of the colony, with its water supplying the heart of Kowloon, and later also being connected to Lantau. Well, here is another example again. So to return to this photo, uh, I'd like to um, explore the pipeline which came to connect Shek Pik Reservoir with Hong Kong Island. So this reservoir, as represented in this map, connects Shek Pik uh, in the far left there with Hong Kong Island on the far right. Um, this represented the construction of, uh, of, uh, of an industrial link in many ways between the isolated Lantau Island and the, and the urban centre. Um, and these islands, Hailing Shao and, and, uh, and Shao Kung To, 
had long been some of the most isolated spots in Hong Kong. Shao Kung To was from the early 1950s used as a rehabilitation center run by Quakers for destitute migrants who had crossed the border from mainland China. The Quaker settle, founder of the settlement evoked romantic images of isolated tropical islands in describing the settlement. Hailing Chow, mean, meanwhile, um, was a leprosarium, um, uh, also having been founded in the early 1950s and was framed in similar terms of being an isolated tropical Arcadia as in this poem by a patient at the Leprosarium, published in 1955, which evoked the island as the leper's paradise with its blue waters and green hills, something which was also evoked by the alternative name of the island as Sunshine Island. The construction of the pipeline integrated even such isolated spots as these, deliberately celebrated for their isolation, and transformed them into key sites in Hong Kong's hydrological infrastructural connection, bringing even the leper's paradise into intimate proximity with Hong Kong Island and Kowloon. So one key consequence of this geographical restructuring was to create a new state depth, if you like, in rural areas, forcing the colonial state to pay attention to issues to which it had once been relatively indifferent or ignorant. Alongside the ubiquity of infrastructure, what is striking about the landscapes of rural Hong Kong is that they are also symbolically rich funerary landscapes, given the large number of hillside cemeteries, ancestral halls, and feng shui woods. Um, uh, the collision of these two forms of landscape, the infrastructural and the sacral, forced the colonial state into extensive negotiation, strategic conciliation to local preference and occasional conflict. Here, there are a few examples. The first in 1974, coming from when the district commissioners of Sai Kang had to deliberately time the removal of villagers according to an auspicious date. The second, also coming from the 1970s, when the state became organized in the exhumation and reburial of ancestral remains. And the third from the 1950s, when, with the construction of Tai Lam Chang, feng shui considerations were accommodated by the disguising of waterwork pipelines so that they did not disturb temples. Being involved deeply in this landscape for in many ways the first time meant the colonial state developing a fine-grained attention to the sacral landscape in often arguably unprecedented ways. The spatial reorganization of water infrastructure created domino effects, as it were, which produced such counterintuitive results as the colonial state commissioning a geomancer uh, in, in the course of its infrastructural construction. Um, and this issue was tightly connected with another important development, which I wish to expand on in greater depth, uh, quite, this being quite fundamental ecological change. Some of these ecological changes are hinted at in the archive, such as with the great preponderance of animals, which either became stuck in the catch waters or turned them into habitat. The unfortunate inhabitants of one village, for instance, uh, ended up finding this cobra in their catchwater, something paralleled in the appearance of catchwater catch snakes in the logbook of Hong Kong's pest control officer, including the longest ever cobra recorded in the colony, um, and which revealed itself to me personally when I was threatened by this cobra at High Island Reservoir a few years ago. Though whereas these ecological transformations are only hinted at in the archive, what is clear is how the construction of this water infrastructure was in many ways the key prompt to the development of natural conservation in Hong Kong. Now this dated back in some ways to the 19th century as Robert Peckham has explored, but really accelerated with the development of this hydrological infrastructure not least leading to the creation of a system of country parks, uh, which closely parallel the reservoir network in 1976. 
The logic here was that planting trees would prevent the rapid loss of water and the potential siltification of reservoirs. The logic was spelled out by Governor Robert Black in a speech in January 1956, where he evoked the forested areas around the reservoirs as themselves forming a kind of reservoir, a water preserved in the soil. Vegetation of this kind, he wrote, meaning trees and shrubs, prevents the water from running down the slopes that it sinks into the soil where it's stored and forms a natural reservoir, feeding the streams and providing a more regular flow into the reservoirs. Afforestation work went hand in hand with the development of the catchwaters. At Tai Lam Chung, a forestry office was created exactly just by the reservoir and immediately south of where the catchwaters reach the reservoir's northern boundary. His work was extensive, this being a photograph of Tai Lam Chung taken by Lawrence Kudori in the 1950s, showing hillsides which are either bare or little covered in vegetation. This photograph, which I've stolen from Florence, um, taken over Christmas, I believe, uh, shows the transformation which has now occurred, um, in which it has become extensively, uh, extensively green. Even by the 1960s, the government of Hong Kong was taking visitors to Tai Lam Chan to showcase its conservation and deforestation efforts. Um, and then these forested areas would form the basis for the country park system in the 1970s with Xingman, Tai, tai Lam, Tai Mo Shan, Plover Cove, Sai Kung East and Tai Tam all being in the first waves of country parks created. Neforestation is another example of the changing attention of the colonial state to these landscapes, not only in the efforts to plant and conserve, but also in the prevention of fire and the consequent management both of the area's ecology and of the behavior of residents and visitors. These plantations were vulnerable soon after being planted. And year after year in the 1950s and 1960s, they were disrupted by fire. This led to the colonial state beginning publicity campaigns against reckless behavior in the countryside, which might cause fires to start. Officials in the mid-1950s in this article may be seen expressing the notion that firefighting is, was itself an issue of water conservation, that hill fires have a direct bearing on water supplies, and for this reason alone, everything possible should be done to prevent them. Employing the slogan, prevent, uh, prevent hill fires, keep Hong Kong green. Conservation and fire prevention was interlinked with the other key development, which I would like to draw attention to as following also from this geographical restructuring, a new system of incarceration. Just as country parks followed the construction of reservoirs, so too did prisons and correctional facilities, so-called. The two were profoundly connected, both in Tai Lam Chang and in Southern Lantau, afforestation was led by prisoners. The Tai, Lam Chung, the Tai Lam Correctional Institute, close to the Tai Lam Chung Reservoir, opened with its first inmates in 1958. The bungalows, which had been created for the Tai Lam Chung Reservoir engineers and workforce, were immediately recycled for the use of these prisoners. The prisoners were then used to plant trees around the reservoir to build dikes and other aspects of the catchwater system, and to fight fires when they, bro out, when they broke out amongst the new plantations. This model was then followed with the opening of the Tongfuk prison in 1966, in which prisoners were again set to the endless work of planting trees, this time between Shekpik and Changsha on Lantau. And if you remember earlier on in this talk, I discussed Hailing Chow, the leper's paradise, which was connected with Shekpik Reservoir via a pipeline in 1964. Um, this hydrological infrastructure then enabled the construction of a correctional institute on this island too, in 1974, which would come to hold Vietnamese uh, refugees. 
And similarly, a prison would be opened at Shek Pik, immediately south of the reservoir's dam, and also not far from the Pongfuk Reservoir. So I'm going to bring us to a, to a conclusion now. And I want to do so first by zooming in to the year 1978. This was the year when the Maklehose Trail opened. This is a long distance trail spanning from Saikang in the east to Kunman in the west. When it opened, it was granted in this manner by the South China Morning Post. These headlines, great for getting away from it all, and escape into the wilderness, or escape to the wilderness, are very revealing. And so too is this quotation, that it is one of the great paradoxes of living in Hong Kong, that we have some of the world's most densely populated areas situated almost cheek by jowl to vast tracts of undeveloped virgin country. These headlines and this quotation Envisaged green Hong Kong as separate from urban Hong Kong. But in fact, it was precisely urban Hong Kong, as I've tried to elucidate here, that was the precondition for green Hong Kong. We might imagine that we are walking the McElhose Trail. We would begin on a concrete path, which is the feeder road to High Island Reservoir. We would pass the reservoir's pumping station and its two dams. Walking through Saikang, we would be in a landscape drained by catchwaters and tunnels to the reservoir. Walking from Saikang to the Kowloon Hills, um, we would follow the pipeline. We would follow its pipeline, um, walking above ground while it passed underneath our feet. Heading north, we would pass along a pass alongside a reservoir system which had developed there since the mid 1930s, the Xing Mun Reservoir, and just north of the lower Xing Mun Reservoir, uh, which is where water is pumped from High Island. We would then reach Taimo Shan, the lower reaches of which have been drained by catch waters since 1937. And we would then walk through a landscape drained by catch waters for the Tai Lam Chung Reservoir. At no time, that is to say, would we be far from Hong Kong's urban hydrological infrastructure. Often, we would be walking directly on top of it. We would less be escaping into virgin country or wilderness than walking through a landscape fundamentally transformed by the water needs of the urban and industrial core. The trees planted around us in Tai Lam Chung and Xing Man were there to protect this water supply. We would also pass through a landscape which had been transformed by prison labor, moving not far from the Tai Lam Correctional Institute. We would be walking, that is to say, through a landscape fundamentally transformed through hydrological engineering, produced in this moment from the 1930s to the 1980s of Hong Kong's catchwater colonialism. So in having elucidated this, I think I've tried to supplement the rich existing literature on the importation of Guangdong's water to Hong Kong alongside other cross-border flows. This importation was of major significance as the, as the body of literature has shown. But attention to these flows ought not to occlude the importance of transformative developments within Hong Kong itself. It was just as novel, perhaps, when Sai Kung and Shek Pik became infrastructurally connected with Hong Kong Island for the first time as when Shenzhen was, even if these connections represent the transcending of a different kind of boundary. And in the speech, I have also at the same time tried to address uh, another audience, those uh, concerned with urban ecology. Urban ecological thinking was in many ways closely associated in the mid 1970s with Hong Kong. Stephen Boyden, Ken Newcomb, and others associated with the UNESCO linked Man and the Biosphere Project set up at the University of Hong Kong. 
their works exploring what they called the urban ecology of the city uh, continue to have a shaping influence on the fields of urban ecology and urban political ecology as they have developed across recent decades. Um, but here I've tried to provide a specific historical context to this mid 1970s work, utilizing recently released government files to more precisely describe the changing metabolism of urban and rural Hong Kong at this moment. And whilst in some ways I've built on the precedence of this work, I have also, I think, pointed to its lacunae. The man and the biosphere project aspired to a certain universalism, choosing Hong Kong at the time, as in their words, it epitomizes the human situation in the late 20th century. But as with earlier ecological work, this program, in fact, worked within a matrix of highly particular political and environmental considerations, which were driving the specific configurations of Hong Kong's urban metabolism. Not least, this has entailed drawing attention to the carceral context of this environmental re-engineering, exploring as here how the labor of correctional institutes uh, helped reshape the colony's metabolism. Um, and so to, uh, to pull everything together and to, and to pull to a close here, in the speech I've tried to undo the binary of urban and green Hong Kong showing them to be in many key ways mutually co-constitutive. At the same time, they've tried to draw attention back to cross-boundary developments within Hong Kong itself, and so too to provide a, a context for many early works of urban ecology. Uh, in this moment between the 1930s and the 1980s of Hong Kong's catchwater colonialism. And I shall pull to a close there. Thank you. <laughs>